what you want, when you want it, where you want it. This is The Mesh. This podcast is sponsored by the 2019 Foot Candle Film Festival. This year's film festival will be held September 27th through 29th in Hickory, North Carolina. Learn more by visiting footcandlefilmfestival.com. Foot Candle Films. Film news and reviews from two guys who really like movies. This episode is brought to you by the Foot Candle Film Society. For a schedule of upcoming screenings and membership information, visit the Society's website at www.footcandle.org. Hello and welcome to Foot Candle Films here on the Mesh.tv. My name is Alan Jackson. I am co director and co founder of the Foot Candle Film Society and the Foot Candle Film Festival out of Western North Carolina. With me, my partner in crime, Chris Fry, also co director and co-founder. Chris, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Looking forward to talking about movies today, which uh, is good. We're on the right podcast. We are on the right show for that. So glad you're joining us for our film review discussion show. This is where when Chris and I get together, we will review a couple of new films with like we're going to be doing today. We go through, discuss the films, review them, give you some insight as to what to expect if you want to take a, a, a watch yourself. Then we move into some news items, take a little bit of time to talk about some upcoming film projects or directors being assigned to interesting films that we want to stay alert for, or just some in- interesting news in the movie business. Then our final segment of the show is where Chris and I both give a recommendation of a film we think is worth checking out. Uh, maybe one you can find online very easily. In my case, it may be one that is now circulating on a certain cable channel quite frequently, so it's actually kind of hard to miss. <laughs> easy so, access. Easy access. So it's a film we think either is worth revisiting, maybe a classic that needs to, to have a little more attention given back to it, or just one that flew under the radar in recent uh, history. So that's our show, and we're going to go ahead and jump right into the first review, which is going to be the documentary, The Biggest Little Farm. This all started with a promise that we'd leave the big city and build a life in perfect harmony with nature, like a traditional farm from the past. Here we are, Apricot Lane Farms. Molly and John are very happy about this. What do you think of this, Todd? This is what we're fighting. So, Chris, with the film The Biggest Little Farm, we it's a documentary, obviously. It's John Chester and his wife, Molly, are working to sustain a farm on 200 acres outside of Los Angeles. Uh, this film chronicles about seven years, it appears, in their uh, efforts to rehabilitate some farmland and turn it into a fully sustainable farm. And by that, we mean a farm that is growing its own crops to sustain the farm, to sustain the animals they grow, that they also use to help uh, populate the farm itself. So everything is kind of uh, this this perpetual cycle is what they're ultimately trying to go for between the wildlife on the farm and the crops that they're growing. We are seeing them start along this path and see the reasons for them starting on this path. We also see some of the challenges they experience along the way. John Chester himself, the director, is the the filmmaker. He is, by trade, a filmmaker, doing a lot of, uh, I believe, animal and nature photography and videography as a, as a career. So going into this film, Chris, it is a film where we are following real-life subjects, and the person showing us the story is one of those subjects. So right away, you throw up the documentary red flag of saying, is this film going to be slanted or more self-aggrandizing than other documentaries who may be taking a more neutral eye with their story. My question to you is, after watching The Biggest Little Farm, uh, do you feel like that the, do you feel like the intent of the film was to really share a, an interesting story that you got a lot from, or do you feel like there was more of an intent to showcase someone who uh, happened to have a really good eye for uh, videotaping animals and nature and wanting to tell the world their own story for maybe a little more uh, self, self-promotion self reasons. Huh. Yeah, I uh, stump you with the question there. So, no, yeah. uh, huh is kind of my reaction to the f- entire film. Mm-hmm. And, you 
know, obviously, I think this film has an agenda, but all documentaries do. This is a documentary, so, you know, um, him being both the star, if you can call it that, um, he and his wife at the center and being the director, yeah, obviously, he's going to show you what he wants to show and all that kind of thing. I, and, you know, he's got the agenda of organic farming and, like, oh, this is the life. I want to go off and do this and, you know, live this life and get away from the big city and, you know. Yeah, to me, it just felt the whole documentary felt you know fairly formulaic. Um, he does have a, a good eye. He is a great cinematographer. What I would not feel like are his strong suits are an editor and a storyteller um, or a writer. He does have a great cinematography background, and he uses that to good effect. But um, I just didn't really get much out of this documentary. I felt like it was. I, I kind of long, um, even though it was only 91 minutes. Um, there was some good context at some point, um, but it was kind of ruined. There were some bookends of the California wildfires, mm-hmm. but that was kind of like spoiled because they put it there. Like I said, it was used as bookends. So that actually provided some real world kind of context a little bit, but everything else felt very intentionally plotted, even though it's a documentary, but it just, I don't know, just you had seven years and you expect certain peaks and valleys and yes, they happened. And it just, it it felt very formulaic. I will say one thing that unfortunately I thought was going to be very entertaining and something I could kind of hang my hat on is like, okay, here's the figure that's going to be interesting. Uh, They had a mentor figure. I Mm -hmm. believe his name was Alan. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) I was able to remember his name. Right. So yes, that was, that was Alan. Uh, uh, I thought he was an interesting figure, and I wish he could have been integrated into the story more. I mean, certain circumstances caused that not to be the case, I understand, but I don't know. Somehow that, that was something that I did find interesting. Um, what, how, what was your take on the film, Alan? Well, I, I think I liked it a lot more than you. Um, I... I didn't find it to be quite as formulaic. I mean, yes, it started and it ended pretty much where I expected it to be. Along the way, I felt like it it had enough peaks and valleys and things that went along that I felt like were fairly authentic about what they experienced or what they went through. I I think I saw the film as a lot more of a feat of um, documenting um, a lot of aspects of nature And bringing in some really nice perspective on how that nature works together. The parts of the film that did not impress me as much are the times where they somehow were very kind of proud of themselves for figuring something out or making some revolutionary move. What I did like is really getting a better sense of a true ecosystem that does exist in a farm like this. I'm not a farmer. I don't have a lot of background in farming a lot of the information or a lot of the things I'm hearing and experiencing in the film were fairly new concepts to me and thinking, huh, that's pretty interesting. Okay, so they've got a snail infestation that's affecting their crops. But what do you do to get rid of the snails? Okay, well, we can't just can't keep going out and going out and trying to do this. Oh, come to find out goats love snails. So actually we have a whole bunch of goats that need some more room to roam around. There's a reason that everything kind of fit together. I love that concept. I love that idea. And I think the film did a fairly well good job of explaining that and showing that. Um, the we figured this out and we made this change and we got this kind of success didn't really appeal to me as much as part of the story. I saw it as more of a nature documentary that happened to be all self-contained on a farm. And it just so happened that the videography of a lot of the animals, especially small close-ups of animals was really intriguing and and interesting to watch. So for those reasons, I got a lot out of the film. I really enjoyed it. Um, There are some questions to me that make the film not 100% something I can really embrace. And part of it is uh, they really skirt around the idea of uh, how much money it took (laughs) to do what they did at this farm. So that in itself is another whole another when you see all the things that are being done to the farm, it does start making see, you thinking, okay, well obviously they have from pretty deep pockets somewhere to do everything that's they kinda, did. That's anybody kinda, who's got access to that kind of money, I would hope would be fairly successful. Right. With I think this did. movie should have just been called Big Farm. Because mm-hmm. it's not a little farm. Definitely not a little farm. And so I, and you know, the means behind getting it made not a little so I think that's my struggle with it, is it just and I, I feel like 
while I like the cinematography or you, you know, the videography, the, the images, I've seen nature documentaries, you know, and I've seen, you know, they came out like the BBC did the whole like planet earth series right. like mm -hmm. several years ago. So, you know, even though this stuff was good, it's like, I feel like I've seen it all before, mm -hmm. but um, the stuff that I did find interesting, like you said, was some of the, uh, some of the lessons they learned. And some of those came about because of the Allen figure. Some didn't, but like you're saying about the whole snail thing like that, it's like, Oh, okay. And it's like some of the documenting yeah. of that. When they start to talk about how everything kind of really fits together and you do start, I mean, they do go and it does over philosophize in, a few, in oh several my places. Gosh. <laughs> Can we have another shot of the sky and the stars yeah. and slowly going by and hear him like rhapsodizing about what all he's learned. I'll, I'll admit they went a little extreme on it, but I do feel like, uh, you know, there were some good messages in there that I think maybe got kind of beat over the head a few Just times. Just a little heavy-handed, yeah. Yeah, but I do feel like it was uh, interesting messages to share. So I found enough value in the film to say that I, I think it's worth watching. I, I had a good time with it. Uh, it's actually when I end up showing to my, my, my kids because I think, you know, there's some interesting things that I think, uh, you know, our kids don't have as much exposure to growing food and tending to their own and self-sustainable type of work. And I think there's some interesting messages and experiences you could learn from it. Um, so overall I liked it. I thought I had, I had a good time with it and definitely sound like I had a little more positive feedback than you did on it, but I certainly recognize and understand the things that you're pointing out because yes, I do think that there are some flaws with the film and some things that make it keep it from being as quite as strong as it could be. Well, and it just, so kind of any rough edges were kind of sanded off and there's no, it's just very like galvanized, homogenized, safe for human consumption. Um, you know, one too many sequences, you know, yes, little baby chicks are cute. Yes. Little piglets, baby pigs. Yes, they're cute. But you know, one too many shots and like holds on shots to be like, okay, let's make sure the audience sees this and goes, oh, you know, just, yeah, I, I kind of had had enough of that. You know, I, <laughs> I wasn't looking for a Disney produced documentary about a farm and that's a lot turns what I felt like this kind of was. It's either, yeah, and that, that's just not my cup of tea. Yeah. Uh, I think that's more of the message. It's not going to be everybody's cup of tea, sure. but I think for people who like this kind of film, I think it's a really well done version of that type of film. Um, you know, I, I'll just say, you know, audiences we showed it to, oh, they loved it, really, really over the moon with it. So loved I think it. it's a real crowd pleasing film. Um, and I'm I'm going to give a, prop, a film props any time that they can make a film that speaks to a good audience, gets a lot of good audience reaction to it, and uh, you know, I think it being a personal story. There's some give and take with that, but again, they're they're documenting something in their own life, which I think is always a cool thing and something I more people I'd love to see do in the future. Uh, but I do recognize some of the things you brought up about, and I feel being bad little. because I feel like I'm the type of person, even though I loved "Won't You Be My Neighbor," the, the Mister Rogers documentary. I feel like, in a way, like. I like that documentary, but like to tear that down, you're like, really? How can you tear down something about Mr. Rogers? And people are like, really? How can you tear down Biggest Little Farm? It's just this sweet story about a family growing a farm. I'm like, yeah, it's not that it's terrible. It's not bad. It just, it just didn't quite work for me in all mm -hmm. the pieces. Yeah, sure. And that's, I, that's what we do. We review films here. So that's, <laughs> that's yeah, true. It's part of the point. So yeah, Biggest Little Farm. I, I don't know how much more there really is to go into it. Cause it really is a pretty straightforward documentary. Um, I will just say again, a few of the positives I say I pulled out that I think are, are, are make the film worthwhile is some of the overall messages on the ecosystem that exists on a farm and really exists in nature in general. I do think the the, the filmography, the the cinematography with nature and with animals, it's very glossy. It's very well produced. So if you're looking for more authentic, really kind of just. Uh, you know, true documentary style. This is a lot more glossy, a lot more produced, mainly because I think the lead guy, the the the, the uh, director, that's his background. That's sure. what he does. So he knows how to do this really well. Right. Um, but I had a great time with it. I thought the film was a lot of fun, and uh, I think the moments that uh, were dramatic uh, hit for the most part. You know, dramatic moments in the film. Um, it is a little concerning to me when I see a documentary and. 
people are in a situation of peril, which we did have a couple brief moments I'm with rolling that. my eyes, rolling my eyes. Yeah, I know you are. A little a bit of the, the, they're in a moment of peril, but yet there's still somebody standing next to them filming them. Oh. In a moment of peril. Okay. To me, that's like, yeah. okay, so in other words, you're basically saying that we kind of know that this is something we're going to film. You wonder how much of the dialogue and how much of the drama is true versus how much manufactured there. I get all that. And that's the, a complaint you can make with any documentary sure. is how much of it's staged, how much of it's real, how much of it's just coincidental that a camera happened to be up and running when it happened. It never got to a point with the film where I felt like it was going too far into the everything being fabricated. There was enough moments that I felt like I kind of feel like this is probably happening right now and I'm okay with that. So, um, so uh, not a perfect documentary, but I do think it's a crowd pleasing one and I think there's a big audience out there for it. So, uh, I'm, I'm giving it a, I'm giving it a, a, I'm giving it a recommendation. I do think it's something worth seeing. Okay. Yeah. Cool. You got anything else? Uh, no, that that's all. I that is my biggest littlest review. <laughs> biggest, Chris's biggest littlest review yes. of the biggest little farm. Well, with that, let's go ahead and move on then into our second review, which is a film starring, written by, and directed by uh, Casey Affleck. It is called Light of My Life. I'm the only girl of my species. I'm the only one I ever saw. He's young. Yeah, he was just a newborn when it happened. Do I have the plague? No, we don't have the plague. But just because people aren't getting sick anymore doesn't mean that the world is right again. When will it be right again? When it's balanced. You know what? I kind of like it, just you and me. Yeah, me too. Who'd believe in 2019 Casey Affleck would write, direct, and star in a film based on that Debbie Boone hit song? Oh, I mean, oh wait, that was "You Light Up My Life," a song from a schmaltzy 1977 film. Not so this you film. light up my life. A couple words difference. But Not this close. film, yeah. Light of My Life, that tells the story of a father and a daughter's journey through the outskirts of a society a decade after a pandemic has decimated the world's female population. Alan, what are your thoughts on Light of My Life? And if you have any on You Light Up My Life, share those as well. I haven't heard the song You Light Up My Life in a really long time. So I'm going to kind of pass on any judgment okay. of that because I feel like you know you need to be a little more familiar with it to comment on it. I will comment on the film, yeah. Light of My Life. Um, so as we mentioned in the introduction, you know, written, directed, and starring Casey Affleck. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a post-apocalyptic film. Uh, I'm not going to say it's a thriller necessarily because even though there are a few moments of some tension and drama, this is really a very uh, paced. deliberately yeah. paced film. We're talking about the relationship between someone who's just called dad in the film and daughter slash son, which we do learn the name. Rag is the name Rag. they use as the uh, nickname for yes. this. This is their his daughter, but yet he has to have the daughter pose as a son because he knows that if people know that she is a young girl, uh, with women having been decimated in the society and no longer around, they are a... Rare, rare breed, rare commodity, and rare commodity, and well wanted by many men in the society. So he's trying to protect her by having her pose as a young boy. Um, it's an interesting film, Chris. I will say, overall, I liked it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think I probably went in with one expectation of what the film was going to be, and it did not meet that expectation. But that's okay. It actually came out with a different type of film than, than I was expecting. And I'm, I'm actually happy with the way it turned out. Hmm. It is slowly paced. It is very deliberate. It is a lot of scenes of just Casey Affleck as a father having a dialogue with his daughter. Mm-hmm. I think it has a lot more to say about the role of fathers and mothers in society. I like the fact that the, the, the lead character we're following Casey Affleck's character 
is not a extremely strong person. Hmm. He has a lot of moments of weakness. He has a lot of moments of frailty. He has a lot of moments of fear. Mm-hmm. A lot of moments of emotion overcoming him. And that was nice to see because normally in a post-apocalyptic type of film where you've got someone caring for a child, they have to be the uber adult, the uber male. Sure. And this is someone that he plays him as someone that is very vulnerable and very unsure of things and very second guessing a lot of his own feelings. And uh, I thought it was a really good performance for that. It's not a performance that really strayed far from what Casey Affleck does normally, but playing a Casey Affleck character, this was a well done one. Uh, And I also think the young girl, Anna Panowski playing rag uh, was also really good. Again, uh, child actors are tough, you know, and we've talked about that before on the show. Sure. I think she's really strong. So I can go into a lot more details, but I'm going to say I, overall, I like this film. I like the vision of the world. It was creating this world building around it. It, it didn't feel the need to go into the, whatever science fiction, elements or whatever factors caused the, the world that they're in. It's just, nope, this is the world we're in. Let's follow these two individuals as they try to navigate some element of it. And I really liked it for that. So I had a, a good time. I've got some other things I can call out about the film as well. But, Chris, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I liked the film. I was surprised, kind of like you. I mean, this people listening to the podcast maybe you know, are like, what, what, what film is this? Mm-hmm. And I had not really heard of it. I think maybe you had mentioned it as a news item at one point. I don't even know if we brought it on the show or we passed it over for some other news items. But yeah. when you recommended we list, we watch it, I was like, okay. And I kind of didn't you know, really know much about it. I was surprised. Um, I think uh, the film, it's not that it's unusual. And I guess that could be a negative in that you know we've seen post-apocalyptic movies. We've seen movies that focus on... Normally, it is father-son relationship as yeah. opposed to father-daughter. Right. Because to me, this is like a mashup throw in a blender of Children of Men and The Road with maybe a splash of Leave No Trace. You yeah, Leave No Trace is one that kind of kind of stuck out to me as well. Which yeah. we've talked about. You know, Leave No Trace we reviewed on the show. And, you know, p- Children of Men and The Road, those are your apocalyptic stuff. But then Leave No Trace is the whole let's stay off the grid, mm-hmm. um, kind of work for ourselves. and there was a lot of pretty cinematography that reminded me of leave no trace of like forests and, you know, Mm -hmm. pretty pastoral scenes when they were out kind of away from society. So that, that kind of impressed me. And, um, I liked the actress too. It was the first time I'd ever seen her. I think maybe it was one of the first things she's ever been in. Um, and she, she has a really interesting face Mm -hmm. and just the way that she didn't over, act kind of the cute things that a child would say and just her mm-hmm. scenes. I mean, basically the film for the majority of the time, it's just those two, like you were saying, mm-hmm. having conversations and for her to be able to react and act to all the talking that Casey Affleck is doing. Cause there's, there's a lot of talking, a lot of conversation, a lot of dialogue heavy. Um, I thought was pretty impressive kind of, and I think, you know, the good thing is you're not going to have to watch a lot of this movie mm-hmm. to decide if you like it. True. Yeah, you can kind of decide really that first 10 minutes. The opening scene is them kind of – he's kind of telling her a bedtime story in a tent. And so there's a lot of stillness, and it's just him relating this story and her having a couple of reactions to it. And I could see a lot of people saying, okay, that's really indulgent for this actor, writer, and director – to do this because, you know, he's the one doing this like kind of Oscar scene right off the bat. You mm-hmm. know? Yep. And at first I did, you know, when the scene kind of kept playing on, I was like, okay, yeah, this is a little, this is maybe a bit much, but the way it wraps up and how threads of that story telling and like some of the things that are said come back through the, the movie, mm-hmm. it really, I don't know. I felt like it was a pretty effective device. So it, it won me over. So I think from that opening scene, depending on how you feel about it, it's probably going to set the tone for the rest of the film. Agreed. Agreed. And I will say, I think, uh, yeah, I was curious how the film was going to end. Of course, we're not going to spoil anything sure. with it, but I do think it ended satisfying for me. Uh, just the last sequence, the last couple shots, just, it worked. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it told you what was happening, what was going to happen next. It was very, uh, I think it, and it brought around the theme, uh, even from the very 
the story we hear at the very beginning sure. that you you were talking about. So I, I think it was strong. You know, I will say on cinematography, I think I noticed. I don't think I saw the camera move ever. I think the camera was about lock steady on every single shot. It, it did. Now the shots were good. There wasn't a lot of movement. I no, I, I, I really. And I just watched it this morning. So I mean, I, I don't think the camera moved really at all. <laughs> I think it was a pretty static shot on almost every shot. Okay. Um, even during the action scenes, there's some scenes of two, you know, guys uh, fighting. Uh, the camera didn't move. I mean, it was pretty much locked down. So uh, that added to the quiet moments of the film. But I also think what it did is there's a few moments where because of that stillness of the camera and the quietness of the film, when you do have a shot of wilderness and you're used to seeing those shots, but then all of a sudden there's people coming approaching from the wilderness and mm-hmm. you, they, it's, it's jarring and it does kind of hit you as it does kind of build some tension, which I think worked really well. Yeah. The dialogues between the two lead characters really comprise about half the film, you know, oh, just them talking easily. and, uh, really even just laying down on a bed, looking at each other, talking, you know, just like a father daughter. It was, uh, you, like, like you said, if you're not into it in the first 10 minutes, you, you're probably not going to appreciate the film as much the rest of the way through. Right. But I do, I think it's a, I think it's a good film. I, I think it's a strong directorial debut. Well, it's not his debut. He did the Joaquin Phoenix quote documentary unquote. Uh, I'm not here. Right. Or is it uh, he's not here, she's not there? <laughs> what is the film's name? It's. I think it may be I'm Still Here. I'm Still Here. Yeah. But definitely with Joaquin Phoenix. I mean, that's the... That's uh, which the, one was the uh, Bob Dylan film that was the uh, uh, Kate Blanchett? <laughs> okay, I'm Still Here is the one with Joaquin Phoenix. I'm Still Here. Um. Yeah, I'm Still Here is the name of that. I think... I'm not there. I'm not is there. The Bob Dylan one. Is the Bob Dylan, uh, Kate Blanchett, right? Uh, film. Okay, we right. just had to get that straight. Sure. So, right. So that was actually technically his first film, although you know it was billed as a documentary. It kind of came out later. That was a lot more dramatic, staged, and uh, and you know acted. Right. But um, still, this is his tr- first, tr- I guess, more traditional film with true acting and true story and so forth. And if you've seen, I'm still here. There's kind of a link to it. In Light of My Life, in Affleck's hairdo. It's very oh. <laughs> reminiscent of Joaquin Phoenix's hairdo. Sure. At least I kept thinking of that. I now, I, I've got to just say, just because, you know, uh, it, it's hard to disregard this when watching the film. It is interesting, and I think the reason we brought up this film maybe a year or so ago was when it was in the news that it was being made as a film. And at the time, all the press was kind of coming around to saying, oh, look, Casey Affleck is doing a film about a world where there's no women. And this was about the time he had just come off some allegations of sexual harassment and maybe not being as uh, appropriate with female uh, co-stars on films in the past, especially during that first film with Joaquin Phoenix that he directed we talked about. So a little interesting that this was the type of film to come out. Mm -hmm. However, I will say, and I'm I'm not trying to intertwine personal allegations, true or not true with his filmmaking desire as a filmmaker. But I think it was really interesting that this film was the choice of the film he made to write and direct. Right. The fact where he wrote it. at the end of the day, I mean, it, it's a, it's a pretty good female empowerment film. So, you know, well, I agree. And I, I think the thing is, you know, I remembered some of the, the hubbub around yeah. this movie and stuff. And so watching it, because you can't separate, if you've heard that stuff, it's kind of hard to completely push it from your mind while you're sure. watching the film. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times I felt like in a way, you know, I don't know the truth behind all the stories. I don't know what's, you know, but I felt like in a way to me, it felt like some of the dialogue specifically that he's speaking at times seems to be kind of like, conf- not conf- I mean, maybe kind of confessional of a sort, but just kind of like, kind of being like an apology in a way for some of the way, you know, some, yeah. of, some of it seems confessional slash apology slash look how broken, you know, society has become. And me as a member of the society, I, I don't yeah. know. It was, it was interesting. And who knows, maybe that's just all colorization coming through my eyes because of having heard that news that you were talking about. I, yeah. I don't, I, I don't know. I did pick up on a couple of scenes. I think there was a scene where he's even talking about uh, kind of uh prejudice and yeah. races. And it's like, 
it is a little bit of a, okay, yeah, we can't treat people this way. Right. Was kind of the messaging he was he was he was sharing with his daughter, mm-hmm. and you know when you do if you are someone who can tend to pull in what you know about an actor or a director personally into it, I think you'll see that there's some interesting connections there. Um, again, I'm not saying that it should be accepted as an apology or excuse anything on the personal side. Right. I'm looking at the film as a film, but you're right; it is hard not to think about some of those things when you're watching some of these scenes that. Well, if he would have been writing this film about the time all that well, was going on. So and that's the thing. You know. if, if he was just acting in it or directing it, that'd be one thing. But the fact that he was writing the lines, that, yeah. that makes you think that he's somehow trying to yeah. make amends. In a Very way. well could be. Very well could be. Um, other, other things you thought were notable about the film? Um, I think we've pretty much hit on everything that mm. I was going to bring up. I will say... The soundtrack as well, just some of the music that's in it kind of heightens tension sometimes when there are things that are starting to go south. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But other times, you know, it's just very quiet, like you would expect kind of a slice of life film about people just walking in the woods or Mm -hmm. these type things. So I I thought it was a really high caliber film. And, you know, I think it's going to fly under a lot of people's radar, probably because you know, it's get, it got a much smaller release. I don't even know if it hit theaters or maybe it hit theaters. And it went straight to online. Okay. Um, so I think if they release it in a few theaters just to get a theatrical release, I think they're counting on most of it coming online now. So, so I think, yeah, maybe, you know, it's one of those things where it could be, it's a backlash because of all the stuff that he, all the allegations mm-hmm. and stuff, which, you know, I totally understand. Um, but it's, it's a interesting film. I think has a lot to say, but um Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think it's kind of a shame that it has gotten the deal that it's gotten, but I understand because you know he's yeah. associated with it. Sure, so. sure. Well, so that's Light of My Life. Again, written, directed, and starring Casey Affleck. Uh, it is available online. So that is the, the the thing about online distribution nowadays. I mean, we can get some brand new films to see right on their day of release if they go straight online as well. Uh, it does give us some opportunity to catch up on these films that don't come to a lot of theaters. But it is available right now on all your streaming platforms, iTunes, Amazon, so on and so forth. And it's not like we both really liked it, so we're both giving it a recommendation of saying, yeah, it's, uh, it's one we think is worth checking out. And unfortunately, I do think it'll fly under the radar for a lot oh, of people. Yeah. So, yeah. All right, Chris, that's our two reviews. We've done the review for just now of Light of My Life, and then we started off with our review of The Biggest Little Farm. So with that, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we've got a couple of movie news items to discuss and then we'll uh, go into our recommendations for the episode. So stay tuned. You're listening to Foot Candle Films here on the TV. Hey, this is Andrew Moose from the Street Circle Drive podcast here on The Mesh. Interested in promoting your business to an online audience? Your ad could be right here. Consider advertising on The Mesh Podcast Network. Head over to TheMesh.tv for details. Welcome back to Foot Candle Films here on TheMesh.tv. We finished up the first part of the show with our reviews of Light of My Life and then also The Biggest Little Farm. Now we're getting ready to go into some movie news items to discuss. But before we do, Chris, let's just go ahead and remind everybody that you know we are listening to this podcast on TheMesh.tv. That is a network of podcasts where you can find us online at TheMesh.tv. That's T H E. M-E-S-H dot TV. From there, you've got a variety of different shows and programs. You could download episodes, subscribe to the ones you like. We do encourage you to subscribe uh, to any show you enjoy, mainly because that's a great way to ensure that the new episodes come to you automatically when they're available and come to your device of choice, your phone, your tablet, computer, wherever you may listen to them. So we do encourage you to check us out, give us some feedback. At the end of the show, we'll let you know how you can reach out to us, provide us with any questions or feedback on this uh, this this show's episode in particular. Chris, let's go ahead and jump into news. I think you have a news item you wanted to share with us, something to for us to discuss. Yes, and actually this is one of the instances where I think this news only broke – Two two days ago, maybe, maybe two or three days, but it's pretty recent. So by the time you hear this podcast, you won't be like, oh, yeah, I'd already known that. Hopefully, this may be the first time you're hearing of it, oh. but I want to get your thoughts I'm on it. I'm on the edge of my seat. So I, know, I know. Sock it to me. Um, Richard Linklater. We've discussed a lot yes. of his movies on this show. His most recent movie, which may still be in theaters, but it's definitely on its way out, 
was uh, Where Did You Go, Bernadette, which I was actually looking forward to seeing, um, but I did not catch it. Starring Miss um, Kate Blanchett. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, and it was based on a best selling novel. Um, but reviews were kind of, you know, middle of the road on it or not very favorable, and I missed my chance to see it in theaters, so hope to still catch up with it. But a lot of people were wondering with Mr. Linklater, he seems to have projects like, let's say, for instance, Boyhood, which he shot over 12 years, the uh, Before Trilogy or, you know, those films that he does. So people were wondering, okay, is this kind of a bad news bears for him? <laughs> Where mm-hmm. he, he did a film that he's maybe not as passionate about. Um, and now, after news broke of his next project, he is supposed to shoot the Stephen Sondheim musical "Merrily We Roll Along." So, okay, that's kind of weird. He's going to mm-hmm. shoot a he's going to shoot a musical. Okay, it's yeah. going to star Beanie Feldstein, and she's from Lady Bird and Booksmart. Uh, ben Platt is going to be one of the other actors. He's the, from Dear Evan Hansen, the Broadway play. So oh, he's a right. big actor okay. in that. And then Blake Jenner, who was in Everybody Wants Some, another Richard Linklater mm-hmm. film, and American Animals. Um, okay. he, he played one of the guys in American Animals, and he was also in the TV show Glee. So there's going to be singing involved. He can sing. So he's got these three actors. Then this is the final, like, do what? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it's going to be filmed over 20 years. Okay. And it's going to be filmed over 20 years, and Bloomhouse Pictures is going to be the people, like, you know, eventually putting it out in 2039 when it comes out. Oh. So it, it has not been filming yet. It oh, is no. getting ready to start. It's starting. And they're committing to a 20 year production. Yes. And principal photography has already been completed for the first segment of the film. And I guess when it was completed, they kind of let the cat out of the bag, like, okay, yeah, this is what we're doing, but don't, it's, it's nowhere near done. It's, we're going to be done 20 years from now. So, as I mentioned, he has done Boyhood, which was Oscar nominated and was shot over 12 years. So he's like, okay, hold my beer. Now I'm going to do a film over 20 years. All right. Hmm. I did not know that. <laughs> so, we, we, before we started recording, I said I had a news item. I was like, uh, Richard Linklater's next film. He's like, yeah, I heard, I'd kind of heard, but I hadn't read a lot about it. I was like, okay, wait. No, I knew the name, I knew sure. it was based on a musical mm-hmm. production. Did not know about the 20 years. Right. That's that's the big... I mean, Sure. Oh, yeah. That's, a that's, musical. I mean, that's he did the big do School of Rock, which yeah. was kind of commercial. He's got a musical uh, ear, sure. and I think a lot of his mu- his films weave in music very effectively. I can't imagine a musical is going to be much of a stretch for him to do. Okay, so He's let's talk about... He's never done an outright musical, True. so that'll be new. Let's but. talk about this concept, though, because, okay, when Boyhood was announced... Mm-hmm. It was had already been filmed Correct. for 10 plus years. Correct. And they said, hey, yeah, this is we, we're going to be filming 12 years. We've already got most all of it done, if not all of it done. Yeah. And so it's going to come out in the next year, and it's going to be this great film experiment to see how this all came together. So there was really no expectations. It was kind of like, oh, wow, that's like a secret project that's been going on for the last mm-hmm. 10 or 12 years. So we're going the opposite direction with this one. Not only longer, mm-hmm. but you're telling people before day uh, on day one that this is happening. Correct. Do you think that's a good strategy? And I'm thinking about it more from a studio promotion, marketing, getting people excited to see it. Is that a good move to tease a film 20 years in the making? Well, if anybody can, I think he can only do it because he made Boyhood. Yeah. And for the exact reasons that you stated, he did that on the sly. Not really pe- many people knew what, we, what was going on. And then he released it. And people were like, oh, my goodness, how did you do this? How did you get backers? Right. And the backing was very difficult, but that sure. was only revealed after the fact. I think now, you know, and he was doing it off an original idea. He didn't have, so whereas Merrily We Roll Along, it's a Sondheim musical. So he's got to get the rights to all that. So I think he has this idea And the only way he can actually get the thing now because it's 20 years, but the hype is there and people will believe in him. It's all marketing. Yeah, I think it's actually a good idea. Now, Hmm. would I want to be an investor on it? I don't know. Can I imagine the amount of production insurance they have on this film in case, I mean, God forbid, any one of those leads that I've mentioned Mm -hmm. have something happen to them? Yeah. Because over 20 years, that's a long time. God forbid anything happened to Richard Linklater. I mean, he is, well, I, I'm 45. I, he's yeah. older than me. 20 years from now, I mean, you know. Well, yeah, that's yeah. a great point. I mean, yeah. I think that's probably why I guess I, I was I was 
got so excited when I heard about boyhood because all that's been taken care of. Like all that worked out. It was done. It's yeah. like, I know there's a finished film. You're not having to like, I'm not having to cross my fingers and say, Oh, I hope it comes together. Richard Linklater is 59 years old. So he'll be 79 years old when this thing comes out. Correct. See, okay. The thing with boyhood is if it didn't work, your lead actor passed away. Richard Linklater passed away. Um, something else fell through financing at the last minute fell through and they couldn't finish the film. None of us would be any of the wiser. Right. Well, the investors would be sad. Well, investors, <laughs> but no, yeah, but yeah, as right. general public, we sure. were like, Oh, we didn't know Richard Linklater was working on a film like that. We totally know that now. So yeah, it's, everybody's going to be watching those actors and actresses and like, okay, you know, uh, they're still acting, right? Are they still in things or is, are they still working on this project? I don't know. I, I'm I'm personally a little more skittish the fact that it's been announced now. I, I I wish they could have pulled off some feat where we did not know until Rachel Linklater was 79 years old and be like, oh, surprise, everybody. I've been right. working on a film for the last 20 years. It's like, oh, my gosh, that would be amazing. And I think that, that would be amazing, even more amazing than Boyhood. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I think it would have been amazing, but I think because it was based on a property oh, they that was already really, in existence, you couldn't really I think get the only way it. they got the rights where they were like, look, yeah, We're, you know, you're right. Boyhood how... was a very more personal movie, sure. and it didn't rely on any uh, intellectual property or anything that would be making news. So I, I get it. I get it, and I'm sure I, I got to assume Richard Linklater probably is not crazy about the fact that all the news is out there about working on this film because I think I, I got the had, impression with Boyhood he, he right. liked being behind the scenes sure. and just like rolling it out now that he's well he's done not with a it. big spotlight type person right. you don't see him going on all the talk shows you don't see him like talking up his films he makes them and then he moves on I just think it adds a whole level level of pressure to the film that wasn't there with Boyhood so right and now that we know that he's supposed to be working on this over twenty years. What else are we going to get from him in the meantime? Are we going to get anything? Or this is his like retirement project? Well, I can't. I mean, they're not going to be filming for 20 years straight. No, so I know, it's, it's like, going to be is like. Is that what he's, all, he's going know, to be working on is, is scripting? Is it like a month and, every year working on it or something? Who knows? And or, then he'll just take, like, is he going to try other film projects in between this? Or is he just saying, nope, this is going to take up the Well, and you know what? I mean, again, we don't, I, I'm not familiar with the, the, the stage production. Are you? No. Okay. I know it's a musical. That's all I know. We hear a 20-year production. Yeah. That doesn't mean there's going to be filming going on all throughout the next 20 years. Right. It could be half of it takes place now, half of it takes place in 20 years. We don't know. I don't know the story. I don't know the framework of the story. So it's really hard to say. Boyhood was a, we're shooting all along the way. I Every think, year we're doing a little bit. Just so. the way that the article's read. Yeah. I'm not sure it has something has to be shot every year, but I think it's going to be a boy. It's going to be an ongoing project. thing, not yeah. a part ones now, part right. two's in 20 years. No, I don't. Okay. I, from the way the flavor I got. Because that would be articles. a little easier to say, all right, well, you know, we're going to film for like nine months. We're going to get this whole part done. Then we're going to like basically break for 18 years. <laughs> right. Then we'll come back and do the last half in that last two years because they wanted the actors to be naturally aged 20 years. You know, Okay. Let me just briefly, I'm pulling this off the World Wide Web. So the musical, one of the musicals when they brought it to Broadway, because it was a 1934 play, and then they brought it to Broadway, they adapted the time frame from, they updated it from 1934 to 1957, and the time period it was supposed to cover was 1957 to 1976. So kind of like there's a 20 year period. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm thinking if it's gonna, covering, if the, if the original is actually like having moments throughout that 20 year history, then yes, they're going to try to do that along with the, the production and film along the way to get those moments throughout that 20 year span. Yes. So, okay. So, well, you know, the thing is if I heard any other director was trying to pull this off, I'd be a lot more leery of it. Knowing it's Richard Linklater who did pull it off with boyhood. Boy, it was a film I wasn't the biggest fan of, but I admired it for the kind of film and the feat that it pulled off, and it pulled it off flawlessly from a production standpoint. So I, I feel like he's the guy to do it. I think my um, copywritten phrase, it's on the back of the Criterion Collection, I'm pretty sure, mm -hmm. um, is that uh, I admire this film as art, not as entertainment. I'm yeah. pretty sure that's on the back of the Criterion box for <laughs> Boyhood. For Boyhood, um, yeah. For Boyhood. So um, just another, the story... For um, merely we go roll along is supposed to be 
around revolves around Franklin Shepard, who, having once been a talented composer of Broadway musicals, has now abandoned his friends and songwriting career to become a producer of Hollywood movies. So that's interesting. Hmm. So, you know, with Ben Platt, who I assume may be this guy he's got, who started on Broadway, has done all these really big roles, and now he's going to abandon his career and songwriting and become a producer of Hollywood movies. So it's interesting. You've got Broadway people. You've got Linklater with Hollywood. I, it's an interesting mm-hmm. synergy there. Mm-hmm. So it is. It's very interesting. We'll see. Wow. I had no idea. I mean, I knew the name of the film. I knew it was based on an existing uh, uh, stage production. I did not know anything about the production schedule. And that's pretty wild. Agreed. Probably the most ambitious like scope of a project I've heard of. It makes Boyhood look oh fairly tame. Right. Because, again, and, and not only because it's a longer period of time, but that point you brought up about Linklater is going to be 79 when it's done. Right. I mean, that's, I mean, yeah, we still had directors directing in their 70s and 80s. Sure. It's not that it's unheard of. It's just it does become a little more of a challenge to get it done at that point. So interesting. Right. Okay. Well, Chris, we talked about a very uh, kind of smaller documentary. We talked about a film that you know probably nobody has heard of that went straight to online for our second review. You're bringing up a kind of a very artistic endeavor that a, a, a indie favorite director is doing. Let me just bring it all back to <laughs> superheroes. Nice. Just for awesome. a little bit. Okay. okay. Just because we're, this episode has been superhero movie free up to this point. We had two independent films. I yeah, know. Right. So let me just kind of balance the scales a little bit and give us a little more popcorn news uh, just for this little bit of the show here. Okay. Okay. The next Marvel movie is going to be done over 40 years. That's right. Yes. They've decided that the, uh, the same duo that did the Avengers movie are going to do a 40 year span production. Right. Now this is Marvel related and it is uh, related to mm, quite possibly my favorite. uh, Yeah. It is my favorite comic book superhero character. We're talking about Spider-Man. There's been some drama. On the Spider-Man front. Almost as much drama about that as there has been the Chick-fil-A Popeye's chicken sandwich drama, which if you would like to plug that, if you'd like to get our take on that, we are on a podcast that's also on the mesh network called street circle drive, where uh, we kind of do our own taste testing of chicken and the results may vary. So uh, if you want to check that out, but Alan, yes, the Sony Spider-Man. Yeah. Yeah. Disney. Let me, let me, let me back it up for anybody who's not, not been reading the trades or not familiar with what's going on. So Marvel Studios, that is a uh, Marvel Comics uh, branded of film studio. They've been making films since the original Iron Man movie, I think in 2006, sure. five, six, somewhere in there. And, of course, wildly successful. I mean, I think they've made 20-some films now. All of them have been hits. Well, it's a good thing uh, because I don't think Disney has ever made any money with any of their movies. No, no, so it's so good that Disney Marvel finally has them. some money, <laughs> finally some money going into the Disney sure. coffers. So, but they brought Spider Man onto the Marvel Universe films for five films. Yes, five films. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is, is that Spider Man is not owned by Marvel Studios. the The film representation of Spider Man is owned by Sony. Sony has the rights to produce Spider-Man films. Gotcha. They had done so, and they did so with the three Sam Raimi films. Then they did the which two rebooted, McGuire. which is Tobey Maguire. Then they did the two, which was Mark Webb directing uh, Andrew, Andrew Garfield. Garfield. Right. Less successful. That second of those two was pretty bad. <laughs> it kind of just ruined the Spider-Man franchise for a lot of people. It did a little bit of like what Batman and Robin did mm-hmm. for the Batman franchise and back Joel in the Schumacher, day. Yeah. Right. Did a little bit of the same idea. People are just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is not good. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. This is a little overblown. This is not the direction we want to go. So Sony ended up making a deal with Marvel to say, look, here's the deal. We own the Spider-Man rights to do films for Spider-Man. But you guys seem to have a pretty good thing going on. And, of course, Spider-Man is, in the comics, a Marvel character. He interacts with the Avengers. He interacts with all the other people in that world. Mm -hmm. So how about let's work together, Marvel. I think, actually, this is probably Marvel's idea. Marvel said, Sony, let's work together. Let's, you know, you license the right, or you you produce your film. We're going to be involved, and we're going to kind of share in the rewards of it. But by doing so, Spider-Man can be part of our universe and interact with our characters, but you still get to make the film. Okay? 
So that happened. They had an arrangement where Spider-Man would be able to be featured in five films. You had uh, Captain America Civil War, where so he was, debuted. It wasn't a time frame. It was just a number of films that he was Correct. allowed to be in. Okay. Yep. So, uh, Spider-Man Civil War. Then which you was had, a cameo, kind of-ish. Eh, yeah. Smallish. Yeah. Uh, Spider-Man Homecoming, which was which, the first true film for him. Right. He was in both of the Avengers movies, the mm-hmm. Endgame and uh, Infinity War. And then we had Far From Home that we just reviewed a couple months ago. Right. So that's the five films. Agreement's done. Everybody assumed they're just going to renew it because it's a good deal. Sony got its highest grossing movie of all time with Spider-Man Far From Home. And the Avengers and all that was great because people liked having Spider-Man in it. So sure. it's like a win-win. Well... Supposedly, the deal is broken down, and it's not going to be renewed at this time. Now, I will say this. Hollywood moves at a pretty quick pace. By the time we've recorded this and it's it gone out, it sure. could have changed. So sure. as of right now today, August 30th, at this date, I'm understanding that there's no deal. What happened is is that Marvel basically said, okay, Sony, yeah, we want to renew the deal, but we want a little higher stake in the rewards. And Sony says, no, nah, we don't. We think we're good. We're, we're good to take <laughs> Spider-Man and keep going. Appreciate your help, Marvel, but we're, 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 we're going to take it from here. So that is the plan right now. So mm-hmm. Spider-Man is now a fully Sony product again and will not have any interaction with the Marvel Universe if unless anything changes. Which, you know, doesn't really, I would think, well, you know, big deal. But then there is that movie that came out that I really actively pretty much disliked. I mean, I, I hated, and I think you, you were not fond of it either. Oh yeah. Venom. Yep. So, well, Venom is a Sony movie that they right. produced on their own. That is Spider-Man that is related. Spider-Man related, although they weren't able to use Spider-Man in that film. Right. But now of course all the rumors are, well, what are they going to do? They're going to bring in Spider-Man with Venom now, or they're going to do, there's a lot of concerns about the quality of the film that may come out because Sony has not had, in the critics' mind, in the public's mind, the best track record with handling this this property. Yeah, so because then wasn't Wesley or no um, Woody Harrelson teased as like <laughs> a new bad guy at the end Carnage. of Venom? Yes, yeah. yeah. No, it was it was all pretty bad. Yeah. And um, even though Venom made a lot of money, they're working on a sequel. Did you hear who's going to direct the sequel? No, uh, Andy Serkis. Really? Yep. Andy Serkis is directing the Venom 2 movie. Hmm. So anyway, that aside. Um, so little give and take on this. Right, so me personally, uh, people have asked me my thoughts because I'm a big fan You're of the character. Spider-Man I'm guy. a big Spider-Man guy. What are, my, what are my thoughts? Do I feel like this is all doomed now? <laughs> my answer is no. I think this is okay. I think that, in my opinion, the Spider-Man movies we've had through Marvel, or at least his appearances in movies... He's been so heavily tied in with the other characters that I actually kind of like the idea of him not being the Iron Man protege and Mm -hmm. not interacting with all the characters so much and having a little more on his own storylines. So if that's going to happen now, cool. Far From Home ended with a cliffhanger, if you recall, during the credits. Yeah. Yeah. However, everything that has to do with that cliffhanger can be handled on a Sony movie without needing because the rest of the Because if I understand Marvel correctly, universe. yeah, like Tom Holland. Yeah, Tom is, Holland signed on with Sony. So, yeah, he can continue. It's, to, it's not like they have to now reboot the actors. No, they can no, continue he, the storyline gotcha. if they wanted to. Well, that, to me, that's a good sign. I do, too. Yeah. I mean, if they keep Tom Holland, unless anything breaks down there, but if they keep him, they continue the storyline that was ended at the end of Far From Home because you did leave a pretty big cliffhanger on the table there for mm-hmm. the character. As long as they can continue that, they still have access to the Spider-Man villains, which I will say the two Tom Holland solo movies have been two of my favorite superhero villains in recent years. Michael Keaton's Vulture and then uh, Jake Gyllenhaal's Mysterio. And because Both those really are fun. specifically those are Spider-Man, Spider-Man villains, villains, then they we still have access to them. Okay, got yep. you. As long as we don't see a drop off in quality. That's my whole thing. But otherwise, you know, the connection to the rest of the Marvel characters, I'm okay with not having that for a while or, or ever. And I'm also okay with us continuing on as long as Tom Holland's in it and we can continue the story with the same kind of characters. I just don't want to reboot. I don't want anything to change up again. We got a good thing right now. You and I have both really liked the two Spider-Man yeah. movies. Uh, yeah. uh, we like Tom Holland in the role. I mm-hmm. like what they're doing right now. I just don't want them to mess that up. Yeah, you know, I think I've been on record, and I think if we went back and looked at all the, if 
if I went back and looked at all my reviews of the different Marvel movies, I feel like I respond generally more favorably to the standalone movies. Yeah. As opposed to the where they plop a bunch of, you know, opposed to the Avengers movies, sure. essentially. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I feel like having Spider-Man just all on his own, I feel like I'm going to still be fine with that. And not yeah. have, because then it's just to me, Mm-hmm. You know, so franchise building, whereas yeah. now it's like, nope, it's just Spider-Man. Well, it's, hanging out oh, it's still going to be franchise it's still building. Franchise. Oh, yeah. Spider-Man Sony's going to do everything they can. It's a Spider-Man franchise and yeah. an Avengers Sony's franchise. Sony's going to do everything in their power to build this up as a franchise well, sure. when they continue it. I just don't want them to change gears on anything if they can help it. That's my only – that and the drop in quality. That's my two concerns. Sure. As long as they continue the storyline they've started and they maintain a level of quality and really take care and attention – with the property, I'm fine with it. I'm actually okay with it. Right. I'm a Marvel zombie from way back in the day. <laughs> I, I like the Marvel Universe. It is fun to see Spider-Man interacting with characters there because that's something he does has done since the 1960s. He's always kind of had these interesting friendships and relationships with other superheroes. I'll miss that. But I'm actually okay because I feel like we, enough of I that. feel like we had so much of it in yeah. those five movies. I'm kind of ready to just focus on him. So, sure. okay, good. Well, we'll see what happens. I'm actually one who's not, you know, uh, singing doom and gro- gloom about this. Like a lot of fans <laughs> online are doing right now. So, sure. So that's our news items. The only other things I'll just drop out there for you, Chris, just before we move on to our recommendations is okay. that there have been a couple of trailers that have come out recently. I know your philosophy on trailers right now for anticipated films. You don't want to watch them. So I'm not going to tell you anything about the latest Star Wars trailer. I have not watched it, but unfortunately, images online and the kind oh, of some of the brouhaha yeah, stuff. Yeah. So, but I don't, haven't watched the trailer. But I'm just well, like, don't oh, you dear. know? Don't. Uh, it does have me worried, though. The poster has me extremely worried. Mm, so yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm kind of worried. I'm I'm kind of with you. Uh, I've gotten a little more concern with this last trailer. Mm. I'll just leave it at that. But it's probably good not to see it, not to build up any I mean, expectations. I, You'll see it in a movie theater at some right, point. Right, I'll so. see it eventually. Yeah. There's no way I'm not going to see it um, in the theater. And they did come out with what's well, probably, I guess, the final trailer for Joker. I did see that. Okay, you did. Yeah. And it's a lot more It's a lot more about the plot mm-hmm. than that first trailer. That first trailer was all about atmospheric mm-hmm. mood. This one, a little more plot heavy, a little more... I'm still really rocking this. I'm looking forward to this film, though. I mean, even after the second trailer, you know, sometimes with these films, the first trailer is the one that gets you the mood and the excitement. When they release one that has a lot more telling you the story, Mm -hmm. it's not, it kind of lessens my enthusiasm for a film a lot of times because I kind of don't want to know that stuff. Right. This one does tell a little bit more story, but I still think there's a lot that they're not telling us, which... I hope that's the case. I hope that's the case. And I think it's, you know, Joaquin Phoenix, he's, he's, he's good. You know, yeah. um, he just, and I really like the first trailer. I like this trailer. Could I have done without seeing it? Yeah. Yeah. But because yeah. I know the whole Joker thing, it's not like something was going to really be ruined for me. But yeah, I, I kind of, that being said, any remaining surprises with, like you said, hopefully there are many. Hope so. Um, I want to go see this movie like the day it comes yeah, yeah, I'm out. Planning so I don't going hear anything. Night. Yeah. yeah. I just, uh, I don't know. I'm really intrigued. Sure. Well, I think the thing that's most intriguing to me is, is that Todd Phillips is directing it. Well, there's that. That's very interesting, c- concerning, but we'll see what happens. Right, but it's like concerning I'm, in an no, interesting way. Like, huh? I'm okay. fascinated at just the, 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 uh, analogies or the similarities to the King of comedy. Yeah. That's yeah. what's blowing my mind. So the film, the uh, um, um, Scorsese, Scorsese film, The King of Comedy, starring Robert De Niro. Uh, you know, in case anybody's not familiar with that film, that is a, a story of someone played by Robert De Niro in that film who becomes obsessed with the idea of wanting to be on TV to the point where he basically kidnaps the host of a talk show uh, with hope. And basically, the guy's a little mentally unstable and just – uh, really obsessing about this idea of being on show. So here in the Joker trailers, I mean, Robert De Niro plays a talk show Absolutely. host and it does seem like the person playing you know, Joaquin Phoenix as the Joker is very obsessed to some degree or fixated with this idea of the show. 
<laughs> it's a little yeah. too weird. It to seems be, like, like there's a lot of together. meta stuff going on, yeah. which I get excited about. So yeah, it's not just like, Oh, we're making a Joker movie. No, it seems as if there's a lot more meat on the bones, a lot more stuff going on. Seems that way. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm intrigued at this oh, point. Yeah. I don't want to read or see anything no. more about it. Okay. I'm Agreed. good. We only have like, I think th- four more weeks to wait. I think it's early October. It comes out. I think out. you're right. So yeah. Okay. Well, that's all the news I've got. So I think we're caught up on that. We're ready to move into the last segment of the show. And Chris, this is where we share our recommendation for a film we think you ought to check out. So, um, Chris, I did the last couple news items. So why don't you give us your recommendation for this episode? Again, this is a film we say it's worth checking back out. Maybe it's online available to, to stream. We're going into Labor Day weekend. I think people would have already heard this after Labor Day. But you gotta, if you've got a weekend coming up, something you want to check out, what do we recommend people, people see? So um, a film that I heard a little bit about uh, in 2018, but just never checked out. Um, it's called The Hate You Give. Mm. And it's based on a novel by Angie Thomas. It's a young adult novel. And I think the subject matter, because I did see trailers for it, I was like, ooh, that looks really rough. And it, it has some rough parts to it. I'll give you the synopsis. A young woman named Star witnesses the fatal shooting of her childhood best friend, Khalil, at the hands of a police officer. Now facing pressure from all sides of the community, Star must find her voice and stand up for what's right. Star is African-American. Can you guess what race the police officer that does the shooting is? I'm assuming white. He's white, yeah. So, you know, right away, that's kind of like, oh, dear. You know, and it is a very tense film, but it is very well done talking about racial divisions. And um, I, I felt like it was well acted. The actress who plays Star... Um, Amanda Stern Stenberg. She mm-hmm. was actually, <laughs> she was in the first Hunger Games movie Okay, and she plays Rue, which I don't know if you've ever, have you ever seen any of the Hunger Games? Movies? I saw the first one. Okay. So the one who girl who plays Rue. Yeah. I don't the, remember anything about she, it. It's like, you know, there's the main <laughs> character and she befriends this young African American girl. Okay. Well, that's this girl. And that's now her. she's grown up. And okay. She's a teenager. Gotcha. Um, but anyways, she, she really had a presence. The small bit she was on the screen in Hunger Games and in this movie, you know, she is the main character. She is star and she's amazing. Um, hmm. I think you can see her career kind of like, yep. And this is, this is going somewhere. Wow. That's um, cool. Yeah. So I highly recommend this movie. It's, you know, of course, unfortunately, semi topical, um, about what's going on today, but in today's world, but it's really well done. I was not familiar with the director, George Tillman. It's the first film I think I'd seen by him, Mm -hmm. but uh, it's PG 13. So if you have teenagers, you know, this might be a film that's definitely, you know, subject matter you could talk about, but uh, it's the hate you give. Uh, It's pretty good. Check it out. Okay. You know, that's actually one. I remember when that came out last year and I had it on my list of ones to try to try to catch up with and never did. So I'm curious. I was, Happy to hear you saw it and happy to hear you're giving it a recommendation. That's great. So my film, Chris, uh, again, we're going to go complete opposites here because this is about (laughs) as far away from the film you just described with a lot of important social issues to discuss and, you know, really dramatic acting and very topical and timely and all. This is none of those things. Okay. And in fact, even as I get ready to talk about this one, I'm already regretting mentioning it because please play some of the trailer because you've pulled it up and you thought of please play some of it fine okay here here's some of the trailer of the film i'm going to be recommending hi everything john and dean solomon know they learn from their father in home school they move a little fast they seem a little slow when it comes to women, they have a hard time <laughs> getting it. You ever like to go out for drinks, unwind after a long day? No. Nor do I. All right. So, yes, the film is called The Brothers Solomon. God, I'm already embarrassed about bringing this up. <laughs> okay. So this is a dumb, you dumb You love what movie. you love. I, I love what I love. There you go. Okay. Will Forte and uh, Will Arnett. Both okay. actors that are funny. Both actors are funny. Kristen Wiig, also someone who's very funny, mm-hmm. uh, in this film. This is a, a story of two well-meaning but socially inept brothers trying to find their perfect mates in order to provide their dying father, who's played by Lee Majors, by the way, nice. the $6 million man, 
uh, to provide their dying father with a grandchild. Um, okay, looking back over the the, the history, uh, uh, Will Forte in particular, this is his first film. So this was before MacGruber. This is before MacGruber. This is about his warm-up. three or four years before MacGruber. Oh wow! This okay. is, I think, right as he was starting on with uh, Saturday Night Live. Okay. Um, and Will, uh, Will Will Arnett, I'm not sure. I can't imagine this was not too deep in his acting career either. So, so this is a pretty so, early work for both of them. So around the time he was doing some work on Arrested Development. Maybe. I think so. Yeah, I think okay. Arrested Development was still kind of happening at that time. Okay. Um, it is directed by Bob Odenkirk. So you I know, know him, better, better Call Saul, but also Mr. Show, Mr. Show. Yeah. Uh, you know, well known in the comedy world for both writing and acting and all. Um, so, yeah, uh, you mentioned MacGruber. If you like the humor of MacGruber, yeah, you'll probably find yourself laughing a little bit more at this film. If you don't find Will Ar- Forte funny in the slightest, you will not like this movie. Okay. Uh, or Will Arnett, either way. If you do not like their their comedy styles, this is not going to work for you. Gotcha. I'm seeing this film uh, most recently because I think IFC, the independent film channel, has been showing a lot of comedies, uh, dumb comedies in the last uh, little bit. I guess they just got the licensing rights to show them. They decided, you know, forget the whole independent film thing. Let's just go with dumb stuff that we can get (laughs) cheap and show a lot. So right. I saw the original Police Academy recently again. Nice. Ooh, that's a bad movie. And then now I'm seeing the brother Solomon, which is I do like. the guy who does the sound effects still effective in Police Academy? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Not a bit. Sad. And Steve Gutenberg. Oh, oh Steve Gutenberg. Um, no, that movie does not hold up at all. Okay. So, yeah. Good to know. Um, the brother Solomon. Probably doesn't hold up much either, but <laughs> I still have a fun time with it. Any movie, any comedy where there's like four or five scenes that I can still think about in my head and chuckle and laugh at to myself, I'm like, yeah, that's a, that's a fun movie. It's definitely not as good as MacGruber. You have actually seen MacGruber. I have seen it you, and liked it. You liked it as well. You understood the genius of, of MacGruber. <laughs> it's, it's great. This is... This is lower tier MacGruber, okay? <laughs> okay. but I still think it's fun. Uh, the two guys, uh, you know, really playing to their comedy strengths, I think, with Will Arnett and Will Forte, uh, you know, trying to figure out how they can have a baby using Kristen Wiig as possibly the vehicle to have that baby, uh, <laughs> them trying to become good parents in preparation for having the baby around. Yeah, there's some funny moments that work. There are some uh, jokes that don't land at all. But mm-hmm. I think overall, if you've got it on in the background for an hour and a half or two hours, it's worth a few chuckles, in my book anyway. So okay. I'm, I'm recommending The Brother Solomon, rated R, hour and a half long. Uh, if you have the IFC channel, chances are it, you can it's see it for on free. probably right now. Actually, go ahead and turn <laughs> it on, and I think you'll see that it's on. Yeah. If it's not on, it is going to be some other... Uh, lowbrow comedy from the last 20 years. Okay. So I think we ran the gamut of a lot of interesting film types during our show today. Indeed. Yeah. Documentary, the biggest little farm I'm giving a positive review to Chris. Eh. Not so much. Chris has got some concerns and issues with it. Didn't get as much from it as I did. Then we both liked the film light of my life by, uh, um, um, Casey Affleck. Not you light up my life. Right. I've got to make sure I get that right. <laughs> Light of My Life by Casey Affleck, we both thought was a really good, strong film and worth checking out. Uh, then we had our movie News, both talking about Richard Linklater's 20-year project. Mm-hmm. Then following it up with me talking about the drama going on with Spider-Man and Sony and Marvel Studios. Then we had our review, our uh, recommendations, The Hate You Give, and me, The Brother Solomon. That's a wide assortment of films that we discussed in this last hour or so. It is. We aim to please. Pretty impressive. <laughs> Chris, uh, let's go ahead and tell people how they can get a hold of us first before we talk about something really exciting coming up very soon. So sure. have people have questions or comments or feedback. How do they, how do they contact us? So you can email feedback to us at info at the mesh TV. Just put foot candle in the subject line. You can follow us on Twitter at foot candle film. Alan and I are also on letterboxd where we track what films we've been watching recently Please consider subscribing to this show on iTunes and leave a star rating or review to help us reach new listeners. Or, hey, encourage a friend to do the same. 
We're on Spotify, Stitcher, and Google Play podcasts. Now, Alan, what other bit of news or information so, would you possibly be wanting to share with people? So we have something kind of exciting happening. If you've been listening to the show, you hear us talk about it several episodes in a row. But we're getting down to the nitty-gritty here. I think by the time you start hearing this, you're just going to be a short time away from our big annual Foot Candle Film Festival. So Chris and I have a film society here in Western North Carolina where we host film screenings on a monthly basis at different venues. But what we do once a year is have our big weekend long film festival. This will be our fifth year. The 2019 film festival is our fifth year doing it. We have 35 films coming in from around the world with many of the filmmakers also traveling to Western North Carolina to spend the weekend with us. We will be showing those films over a three day festival on September 27th through the 29th of 2019. Tickets can be found online at footcandlefilmfestival.com that's where you can buy either individual tickets for individual films that you see that look interesting or just buy a weekend pass if you're indecisive and just want to have the flexibility of coming and going to any film you want to throughout the entire weekend we have our opening night Friday night opening night reception with short films and a great reception in an adjoining art museum then we have our closing ceremony dinner where we give out our awards and also get uh, to hear from the recipients of our annual Filmmaker Grant Program, which is something we're really excited about. All the ticket proceeds from the festival go into the Filmmaker Grant Fund for next year and is given out to filmmakers that are working on interesting projects here in our state. Chris, what have I, what have I missed about the festival? What, what, what are you the most excited about with the festival right now? Well, um, I think something that will be new this year, I think you didn't mention it, was actually the festival runs from the 27th to the 29th. Yep. But on the 26th, we have an event. Right. That's going to be, this will be the first year we've done this specific event. We're teaming up with the visiting writers series at Lenore Ryan University, and we're having a screenwriter come in and talk about his process. We had a contest and a bunch of scripts were entered. This person won. He's going to come and talk about his screenwriting process. And then we're going to have a table read of portions of his script where actors will sit around and read a bit of his script and audience will get to ask questions. It should be a really good time. So that's on the 26th. So that will be an event over at Lenore Ron University at 7 o'clock on the 26th. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's going to be great. We're, we always try to do something a little different or add something to the festival every year. And this year with the script writing competition, that's going to be a, a really interesting and fun event Thursday evening before the official festival kicks off Correct. on Friday. So, so, yeah, so really from Thursday night through Sunday night, we got some film-related activities and events and receptions going on in Western North Carolina and Hickory. We're at the Salt Block Auditorium, which is, uh, if you look up the Salt Block in Hickory, you'll find that it's the Art Museum, Science Center, and a great auditorium for us to do our film screenings. So it's a great, great time for the weekend in general. And uh, FootCandleFilmFestival.com is where you go for schedule, information, and for tickets. I'll you know, throw out one last little thing. If you haven't heard us talk enough about the festival or enough about our film society, or you, you just want to know more about Foot Candle for some reason, our state magazine actually uh, wrote a nice article about Foot Candle, about the festival, about the society. If you go online or pick up a copy at your local grocery store or wherever they sell fine magazines, um, you can uh, learn a little bit about the September issue features uh, Foot Candle. So, Yeah, just, uh, you know, they'll be alarmed by the large picture when you flip to the article. Chris and I stuffing our face with popcorn. True. We, uh, you know, although I will note, we didn't get to eat any of that popcorn. No. It so it's all fakery, people. Right. So <laughs> don't be misled by the photo. It may look like we're enjoying big buckets of popcorn. We didn't we eat a not. single one of those. That's so, true. Yeah. But that's all right. It looked good. It was a good looking shot. So, All right, Chris. Let's go ahead and wrap it up. This has been Foot Candle Films here on the TV. We typically post about two episodes a month. And so we will look forward to talking to you about films uh, the next episode we post. Thanks. See you in the ticket line. Special thanks to Carpal Tuller for the show theme music. For more about Carpal Tuller, visit www.carpaltuller.com. You've been listening to The Mesh, an online media network of shows and programs ranging from business to arts, sports to entertainment, music to community. 
All programs are available on the website as well as through iTunes and YouTube. Check us out online at themesh.tv. Discover other network shows and give us feedback on what you just heard.